All right, welcome back to another Wednesday wake up. I'm back in the Happy Friday arcade down in the basement, so that's why I got some extra chotch and Star Wars stuff and all the rest. I thought it'd be another fun angle to take a peek at. Uh, but we are still cruising on through uh, John chapter 16 and still within the farewell address, it's often called. Um, but in this case, Jesus is is not so much on the warning side of things, not so much on the uh, the world will hate you and this is what you need to do to protect yourself. Um, but we're getting towards a, a glimmer of hope. Um, and actually, there's a, there's a promise in here that really caught me. And when Jesus makes a promise, uh, we know that we can depend on it because Jesus never breaks a promise. And that's uh, a promise that our sorrow will turn into joy. Uh, he's telling that to the disciples, and it's really telling uh, that thing, the same statement to us as well. Um, and he uses an analogy in the process uh, that should should hit home, and it should also apply to us uh, because the end message is that that promise uh, applies to us as much as it applies to those disciples. Uh, and so we're still in chapter 16. Let's find out what God uh, has us understand today. Uh, so reading John chapter, chapter 16, verses 16 through 24. A little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Then some of the disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying to us, a little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They said, what does he mean with this a little while? Do we not know what he's talking about? Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, are you discussing among yourselves what I meant when I said a little while and you, you will no longer see me, and a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice, and you will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joys of having brought a human being into the world. So you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy from you. On that day, you will ask nothing of me. Very truly, I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. This is the word of God for the people of God. So thanks be to God. And so we get a couple different things going on here. We have, uh, first of all, I think a, a comfort for us um, because we see a bunch of disciples that are confused. Uh, and if you've ever read the Bible, if you've ever heard a passage and you say, huh, like, what are you even talking about? It just is over this past week. I got a text from a friend of ours uh, who has decided to try to get through the Bible this year. Uh, and she has uh, gotten to the point where she's saying, you know, I'm, I'm going through Genesis and I just I just don't know what's going on. I need to get some additional um, help as to what it is the Bible is trying to say. Um, number one, I applaud her for. For, for, for persevering. You know, it's easy to just take the Bible and, and get to a passage and say, I just don't get it. You know, there's no way I'm ever going to understand this. Um, but she is, she's persevering. Uh, and so I think this passage kind of gives her the incentive, gives us the incentive to, to persevere. Here's a bunch of disciples that were with Jesus, um, watching him do miracles, asking them any question that they want, the fountain of knowledge uh, was at their disposal, and yet they were totally baffled and confused by what Jesus was saying. And and he he said this little while thing many times before, um, and so it shouldn't have come as a surprise, and yet they were confused. And so I just thought that was a neat little nugget of, of godly wisdom that was put here in, in God's word, that, um, that even the disciples were confused. And so if we don't understand where Jesus is taking us, if we don't understand a uh, certain passage in the Bible, if you don't understand what it is that God wants us to hear, um, just persevere because those disciples did and Jesus answered them, uh, gave them the answer to their question of, of what is this little while that they're talking about. Uh, so this this little while uh, that they were confused about with, um, and good morning, Scott, sorry, I didn't, didn't catch you anyway. Um, <laughs> this little while that they're talking about um, is, is a confusion for them. And 
a lot of times this this passage can be interpreted a bunch of different ways. Uh, when Jesus says, a little while you no longer see me, and again, a little while you will see me. Um, we know from, you know, understanding the progression of, of what's happening here. This is Friday night, uh, probably after midnight on Friday. Um, and so this is the, the farewell address after the good, uh, the, after the, the, the supper, um, when the disciples were asking him all these questions. And, and we know within a number of hours, uh, once, once the sun rises on Friday, uh, those will be the last remaining hours of Jesus walking on this earth. Um, but we know what happens on Sunday, right? We know that he, he is resurrected when then, then he teaches his disciples and then he, he ascends and uh, seated at the right hand of the father. We know the rest of the story. Those disciples didn't. Um, and so we can interpret this by saying, well, what Jesus meant was, was that, you know, in a little while you won't see me, I'll be buried in a tomb. But then in a little while, I will see you again, in other words, I will be resurrected on Easter Sunday and, and be with you. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is maybe he's talking about his second coming, um, because what we heard here is uh, is an analogy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come, uh, and and many times the the second coming uh, is is referred to as as birth pangs. If you take a look at um, at Matthew chapter twenty four, um, the disciples were saying, "Tell us." When will this be and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Uh, and Jesus says, for nation will rise against nation, the kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of this is but the beginnings of birth pangs. So those birth pains um, that are often referred to when it comes to uh, the, the second coming. Um, and so we, we're, we're stuck with what is Jesus meaning here with this, you know, I'm going, you're not going to see me and then you will see me. Um, I think the key here is this little while. And like I mentioned before, he said a little while several times to the disciples, and that shouldn't have come as a surprise. And so let's just do a quick recap of where else he said a little while. In chapter 12, he said, uh, the light is with you for a little longer, basically using that same word. Um, walk while you have light so the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you're going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of light. And so he says, the light is with you just a little longer. He's referring to him, uh, to, to himself, saying, you know, uh, the light is with you just a little longer. Again, in chapter 13, little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me as I said to the Jews. So now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. And again, in chapter 14, in a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. And so this whole little while statement is something that they should have been familiar with. They should have, you know, should have keyed something in their head when he said it again, but they didn't. Um, and but it also gives us an indication of what Jesus meant by a little while. And whenever he referred to his earthly ministry, he said it was just for a little while. And we know that Jesus uh, didn't have a long earthly ministry. Uh, and so to think that that that's little while when when the disciples will see him again was was during his second coming. Uh, that doesn't really jive because it's been almost 2,000 years since he said that statement and we haven't seen Jesus' second coming. And so that doesn't sound like a little while to me. Um, I don't believe that it means uh, that this little while is just the, the few days until his resurrection um, because um, that's, that's, that's not what he's indicating here, especially with this, um, with this indication that what I'm saying is when I go to the Father, because when Jesus goes to the Father, he can't be seen, right? Uh, when, when he went to the Father to be ascended into heaven, uh, he wasn't seen, and, and he's not seen now. Uh, and so even after the resurrection, that doesn't make sense for that little while. So here's the key. I believe what he's saying here, and this is the other commentators have agreed with this, is that this little while when we will see Jesus again is in the form of the Holy Spirit. And why do I say that? Um, basically, Jesus, you know, the, the disciples said, um, you know, what does he mean by saying to us a little while and you will no longer see me? And again, a little while you will see me and because I am going to the father. And so Jesus must have said, uh, you know, either in this statement or we know in earlier statements that that you will not see me because I'm going to the father. And if you look just up ahead. Um, chapter, I'm sorry, this is a 16. 
Nevertheless, I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I, if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And where is he going? He says, I am going to him who sent me. I'm going to the Father, in other words. And so when Jesus goes to the Father, Jesus leaves us the Holy Spirit. And when this little while, when you will see Jesus, Jesus is talking about, you will see me in the form of the Holy Spirit. Um, that's not the only you know, place that this could be evidence of. If you look in, in Romans, um, the Holy Spirit is, is referred to as the Spirit of Christ. Um, check out what, what Paul wrote to the church in Rome. He says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And so this promise that Jesus is giving us, this promise that you will see me again, is not just a promise to the disciples, it's a promise to us as well. Because when, when we see the Holy Spirit, we see Christ. And that's that unity that I think that, that we need to get from this, um, from this passage, is that when the promise of the Holy Spirit comes, when the, when the advocate is given to us, when, when Jesus goes to see, be seated at the right hand of the Father and, and, it, and it goes to the one who sent him uh, and to give us the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit is the representation of Christ in this world. We heard before that, that Jesus said, I gave everything to the Spirit um, so that when, when the Spirit is revealed, it glorifies Christ. And so in order to, to you know, we will see Jesus uh, in the form of the Holy Spirit um, when we see him again. There's another piece in here that, um, that talks about this coming of Christ. And this is, um, is a passage or a piece in here. It says, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice. That's from Isaiah, um, in a passage of the prophet Isaiah, uh, when he says, you shall see me your heart shall rejoice, your body shall flourish like the grass. This is uh, basically the reign of God within this world. And so the coming of the Holy Spirit is the reign of God in this world when our hearts will rejoice. And this is when that promise comes into play. Our, our sorrow will turn into joy uh, is the promise of Jesus when the Holy Spirit comes. And why is that? And here's the other piece that really caught me. And, and I think we should, we should, we should be able to, to hold on to this. It says, and no one will take your joy from you. So let me ask you, how, are you joyful all the time? Um, because I know that I'm not joyful all the time. And I think that kind of probably comes from my definition of joy. Um, and this is where another thing that came into, into my, my site. Uh, just this past week, I was talking to a brother in Christ who, um, who just recently uh, Reread or re listened to uh, The Case for Christ, the Lee Strobel, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Rick Warren um, book. Um, and his wife, uh, Carrie K. Warren, um, wrote a book, says uh, the, the name of the, uh, the book is Choose Joy Because Happiness Isn't Enough. She says, Happiness is completely connected to what's happening to us on, in the external circumstances of our lives. Joy is unrelated to what's happening. Uh, to us on the outside. If joy is only tied to external circumstances, we're all lost. Very few of us ever experience joy. But when joy is turned around, see, she has a new uh, definition of joy. She, she gives this definition of joy. It's the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life, the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right, and the determined choice to praise him in all things. The settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life, the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right, and the determined choice to praise him in all things. That's her definition of joy. And this is someone who, who understands the troubles of life. She had cancer. She, she uh, raised a, a son that had mental illness and eventually uh, would take his life. This is not a woman who is living the, the, the perfect life. Um, she understood that that happiness is different from joy, that joy uh, is something that is a, is a decision, that joy is something that was gifted to us uh, in the salvation 
uh, that Jesus promised us. And that joy can't be taken away because that salvation can't be taken away. You see, this is why Jesus said, but your pain will turn into joy. That's another word. Another translation is it will become joy. And, and so in other words, there's something in that joy that has a necessary ingredient of the pain, of the sorrow, of the, the hardness of this world that we have to go through in order to understand that joy. And that's why Jesus uses the analogy of, of a, a woman in labor, because there's no, there's no way that you can have the joy of holding that child. There's no way that a child can be born without that pain of labor. And remember, this is not uh, a time where, where there were epidurals, where there was um, uh, pain meds. For, for women to go through. That's the, that's the pain that Jesus wanted people to understand. You have to go through that pain in order to understand that joy. And in the same way, Jesus was saying, I have to go through that pain. I have to take that sin on myself. I have to be beaten and killed for your pain, for your sins, in order for you to understand that joy that can't be taken away, that salvation that can't be taken away, that when I, when I resurrect, when I go to the right hand of the Father and I give you myself in the form of the Holy Spirit, that's something that no one can ever take away. None of the hardness of this world, none of the pain of this world can ever take away. That's joy. It's not happiness. That's not just like, you know, external things that we, that we do to make us happy in passing by. This is eternal joy in the understanding that Jesus died for us, that Jesus took that pain and, and conformed it, transformed it into joy for us, into salvation for us, so that we can have something that the world can never, ever take away. Very truly, I tell you, if you ask anything uh, in my Father's name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that joy may be complete. We not only have everlasting joy, but we have complete joy. Joy in the knowledge of our salvation, assured in the pain and the sorrow of Jesus, transformed into joy. That's what I think we need to get out of this. And so, I don't know, I hope that something that I said here is, is from God and and planted in your hearts. I hope that we can take this with us to understand that the, the promise that Jesus gave, that, that we have joy that can never be taken away, uh, something that we can claim for ourselves and, and, and take with us uh, with that hope and with that joy and with that everlasting, um, with everlasting joy that's given to us through, through Christ. So let's pray for that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for for the ability to dig into your word, for uh, for the, the abilities and the inabilities that I have to try to convey that, Lord, I pray, I pray that your your message is truly what was heard today. That that your your hope, your joy, is what gets planted into the hearts of everyone who listens, um, despite my uh, my efforts. Lord, I love you, and I, I want to continue to serve you. And please let us continue to 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 radiate your joy wherever we go in this world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you all, and we will catch you next week.